Ptah is an Egyptian deity responsible for creating the world, manifesting it through potent force of spoken words. A hymn from Egypt's 22nd dynasty praises Ptah for shaping the world with the vision of his heart. Meanwhile, the Shabaka stone, originating from the 25th dynasty, mentions Ptah bestowed life upon all deities and their spirits using his heart in his voice. The creation by the voice, something we see in the God of the Old Testament. His worship then moved beyond the borders of Egypt all the way into Syria and was exported throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Through dissemination by the Phoenicians, we find figures of Ptah in Carthage. His epithets, Ptah, the begetter of the first beginning, Ptah, Lord of Truth, Ptah, Lord of Eternity, one who listens to prayers, master of ceremonies, master of justice, the God who made himself to be God, the double being, the beautiful face. Now, some of you watching this right now may be familiar with the Heliopolitan Aeneid and the creation myths that say that Amun or Atum is the self-created craftsman who created the other gods. And though this is certainly true, the priesthood in Memphis and Crocodopolis and the Elephantines have competing mythologies that make Ptah the self-created demiurge who creates the other gods and humans. An elephantine, Kunum, who like Ptah, is also depicted as a craftsman or demiurge with the potter's wheel behind him, just as Ptah has images of himself with the potter's wheel behind him, as he creates gods and humans alike. Porphyry once said, At the city of Elephantine, there is an image worshipped, which in other respects is fashioned in the likeness of a man and sitting. It is of a blue color and has a man's head and a diadem bearing the horns of a goat. He sits with a vessel of clay beside him, on which he is molding the figure of a man, and from having the face of a ram and the horns of a goat, he indicates the conjunction of sun and moon. Ra and Yah in the sign of the ram, Amun, while the color of blue indicates that the moon in that conjunction brings rain, Tefnut. He goes on to say, In the mysteries of Eleusis, the Hierophant is dressed up to represent the demiurge and the torchbearer, the sun, the priest at the altar, the moon, and the sacred herald, Hermes. Moreover, a man is admitted by the Egyptians among their objects of worship. For there is a village in Egypt called Anubis, in which a man is worshipped and sacrifice offered to him, and the victims burned upon his altars, and after a little while he would eat the things that had been prepared for him as for a man. They did not, however, believe the animals to be gods, but regarded them as likenesses and symbols of gods. And this is shown by the fact that in many places, oxen dedicated to the gods are sacrificed at their monthly festivals and in their religious services, for they consecrated oxen to the sun and moon. What I find the most striking about this passage is his comparison to the Eleusinian priests of Bacchus and Demeter. Now, Kunum who Pharaoh Khufu was named after, the famed builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza, almost seems like a perfect synchronization between the competing creator gods Amun-Ra and Ptah. Ptah is one of the three major gods of the Memphis Triad, along with Sekhmet, and he's also the father of Nefertem. And Kunum has an almost identical role within the Elephantine Triad. The Temple of Elephantine was dedicated to Kunum, his consort Satis, and their daughter Anuket. Elephantine is the city where dozens of Jewish Aramaic texts were found that not only physically predate every fragment or manuscript of Hebrew Bible in existence. I repeat, the Elephantine city where we found older 
Jewish Aramaic fragments than any existing fragment or manuscript of the Hebrew Bible in existence. But also, it shows that the Jews at Elephantine in the 4th and 5th century BCE were still polytheistic during this time. Following the 587 BCE destruction of Jerusalem, some Judean refugees traveled south in what may be called an exodus in reverse, settled at Elephantine. They maintained their own temple, the house of Yahweh, or Yahu in this case, in which sacrifices were offered, evincing polytheistic beliefs, functioning alongside that of Kunum. Gods like Osiris and Isis are all over the place in these texts. The temple was destroyed in 410 BCE at the instigation of the priests of Kunu. So what happened? Was Yahweh in direct competition with Kunu over who is the true divine craftsman? Possibly. One of the most common attributes among these metallurgy craftsmen gods like Hephaestus of the Greeks, Ta of the Egyptians, and Vulcan of the Romans is their connection to volcanoes and mountains due to the richness of metal ores found at these places. It is very possible that Yahweh is no exception, although he's from an entirely different location. In Exodus, the presence of fire and smoke is paired with the mountains quaking. These tremblings, akin to small earthquakes, are typical of volcanic eruptions, leading to the expulsion of warm gases from the cracks. This expulsion is accompanied by a significant sound, referred to in the Sinai Theophany as powerful shofar sound. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and fog. Then Yahweh spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Yahweh's revelation is always at a mountain, whether called Sinai or Horeb. The event pictured like a volcanic eruption. As these texts show, volcanism seems to be an essential attribute typically associated with Yahweh, linking him to the craftsman metallurgy gods, as I mentioned before. The account of the Sinai revelation, with its volcanic imagery, is meant to show that Yahweh himself is not just his divine emissary, but a demiurgic craftsman. The mountains melted, Nazlu. To Yahweh, Sinai before Yahweh, the God of Israel. Some believe Mount Sinai might be one of these Arabian volcanoes, which the Israelites approached in the text when departing Egypt. Jacob Dunn even theorized that Yahweh was once an Arabian volcanic deity. This ties into the theory that Yahweh's worship in Israel has Midianite roots. This theory draws from biblical references that depicts Moses' introduction to Yahweh in Midian, near the mountain of God, close to Jethro's residence in Exodus 3, 1 through 6. Here, Moses is instructed by God to bring the Israelites after their Egyptian exodus, Exodus 3, 12. Intriguingly, Moses' father-in-law is portrayed as a Midianite priest, suggesting Moses might have adopted local religious beliefs from him. In other passages, Moses' father-in-law is identified as a Kenite. Some Kenites settled in Israelite lands and maintained a close alliance with them. The biblical figure Cain considered the Kenites' founding ancestor is significant in early biblical narratives, highlighting this group's ancient proximity to Yahweh. Cain's role as the initial person offered to Yahweh in Genesis 4.3 reinforces this notion. While Yahweh's association 
with the Midianites might explain Israelites using volcanic imagery to depict the divine presence. Linking Yahweh to the Kenites prompts a reevaluation, especially considering the Kenites' metallurgical pursuits. The Kenites seem to have been skilled metal workers. Genesis 4 discusses Cain's descendant, Tubal Cain, as a craftsman skilled in molding copper and iron. Semitic cognates of Cain hint that metallurgical activities were integral to its meaning. Hence, Cain might originally have been represented the pioneering figure in metallurgy with the Kenites both metal workers and smelters, as his successors, their association with the volcanic deity, like Yahweh, becomes clear in this context. Historically, deities linked to metallurgy were also connected with volcanoes. For instance, Hephaestus was linked to Mount Etna in ancient Greece, and the term volcano originates from the Roman god of metallurgy. Vulcan. The connection between volcanoes and metal smelting is straightforward. Both release similar odors and plumes of smoke. In past times, smelting was the sole human activity involved in melting stones. Lava pouring from volcano mirror slag from a furnace, which once solidified resembles volcanic rock. This similarity is evident in Exodus's description of the Sinai revelation, comparing the ascending smoke to that of a furnace. Exodus 19.18 The persistent use of volcanic imagery when describing Yahweh implies a deep-rooted metallurgical aspect to his earlier identity. Notably, the Song of Deborah associates Yahweh near Arabah's copper mines. This volcanic aspect of divine revelation is also highlighted in Deuteronomy's account of the Horeb revelation. It notes that Yahweh communicated from amidst fire and smoke, essentially from the volcano's core, while it erupted. O oh, Yahweh, when you came forth from Seir, advanced from the country of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dripped, yea, the clouds dripped water. The mountains quaked or flowed before Yahweh, the one of Sinai before Yahweh, God of Israel. The writings in Zechariah support this idea. The book starts by sternly rebuking the earlier prophets of Israel, accusing them of abandoning the paths of Yahweh and ignoring his call. Zechariah 1, 4 through 6. This assertion is further elaborated when the text predicts the arrival of four rescuers dispatched by Yahweh, referenced as smiths in Zechariah 2, 3 through 4. Smiths in subsequent revelation, Zechariah 6, 1 through 5. Zechariah witnesses four soaring chariots representing the four winds originating from the Bronze Mountains. This terminology alludes to the copper mining regions like Araba and Sinai, hinting at Yahweh's earlier residence. Thus, even in Zechariah's time, there were those who recalled Yahweh's association with metallurgy. Recognizing Yahweh's historical role as the deity overseeing metallurgy in the southern Levant sheds light on various aspects of his biblical character. In fact, Yahweh is nowhere to be found in any of the Ugaritic or northern Canaanite texts or inscriptions, which are dominated by El and Baal as well as different craftsmen god, Kothar Wakasis, who I mentioned earlier, 
who's identified with Ptah in, in texts that survive from Memphis, as well as Anki of the Babylonians. So Yahweh is most likely local to the southern Levant near the Sinai Desert and Midian. In Isaiah 31, 9, an oracle of Yahweh, whose fire is in Zion, in his furnace in Jerusalem. Imagery of metal urgy undeniable here, surrounding Yahweh. This could also help explain the biblical author's attempts to polemicize Baal as an evil opposition to Yahweh, considering how popular Baal was to northern Israel in being the prince and son of El. He only has to be opposed by Yahweh. While many view this portrayal as merely a symbolic expression without deeper theological meaning, considering the other metallic attributes associated with Yahweh, it probably reveals a metallurgical facet to Yahweh's worship in Jerusalem. In this perspective, the numerous metal artifacts in the Jerusalem temple aren't just symbols of grandeur, their context largely detailed in Exodus via the depiction of the tabernacle it specifies about the metals used hint at deeper theological importance they held they symbolized the heavenly furnace within the israelite sanctuary turning it into the earthly abode of the israelite deity moreover the copper clad altar in the temple's grounds lends a metallurgical undertone to the sacrifices the glow from this copper surface when heated to nearly 1,000 Celsius for the burning sacrifices is reminiscent of the luminance of liquefied copper or gold. The beginning of the prophet Ezekiel's vision recounts his entrance into the heavenly realm as follows. And I looked and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with a fire flashing up and brightness around it, and in its midst, something like Hasmal, out of the midst of the fire. The vision illustrates Hasmal, an entity radiating powerful luminance amid celestial flames. This unique term is exclusively found in Ezekiel's revelation within the Bible. However, comparable words appear in both Egyptian and Akkadian, Hashman and Hashmalu referring to an amber or yellowish orange metal or metallic mixture. The Septuagint translates it as electron, signifying either amber or electrum, a natural blend of gold and silver. While many translations peg Hashmel as amber, this interpretation doesn't quite fit, given the reference to the glowing embers within the flame. In Ezekiel 1.13, it's more likely that Hashmel alludes to something shining brilliantly due to high heat. Considering that burning amber emits smoke but not light, it stands to reason that in Ezekiel 1, Hashmel is more likely a representation of liquefied metal. When they moved, I could hear the sound of their wings like the sound of mighty waters, like the sound of Shaddai, a tumult like the din of an army. In Ezekiel's depiction of these beings and their movement, it seems he's detailing the powerful gusts that fuel the celestial furnace, enhancing the creation of shining embers. Essentially, this vision portrays Yahweh's divine realm as a massive kiln encircling by winged entities that drive the air, current akin to bellows, taking into account both Ezekiel's imagery and Isaiah's analogy. It becomes clear that these prophetic insights symbolize Yahweh's manifestation in both the celestial and terrestrial realms through the imagery of a colossal furnace. This emphasizes the strong ties of his worship to the world of metallurgy. The oldest plausible occurrence of his name is in the Egyptian land of Sashu Yahweh, 
an inscription from the time of Amenhotep III, 1390 to 1352 BCE. The Shasu being nomads from Midian. Yes, Midian, there you go again. And Edom in Northern Arabia. This gives the Yahweh as a Midian god way more plausibility. When we look at the Greek sources like Herodotus and Plutarch, for which gods are worshipped in this region, they both claim that it's Dionysus and Venus that are the main gods worshipped here. One might immediately dismiss this due to the blatant differences between the Greek Dionysus and Yahweh. However, the Bronze Age Dionysian religion was so widespread and his worship flourished from Turkey down to Egypt along the Mediterranean. So if Yahweh was connected to this ancient god in any way, he would almost barely resemble him anymore by the time of antiquity. It's possible that Yahweh could be a metallurgy volcano god with Dionysian attributes. For example, figures like Tacitus, John the Lydian, Vero, draw parallels between Yahweh and Bacchus Dionysus. Often Jews employed symbols commonly linked to Dionysus, including kylixes, amphorae, ivy leaves, and grape clusters. Plutarch highlighted these resemblances to argue that the Jews venerated a version of Bacchus Dionysus. In Plutarch's questions in Moralia, he points out that Jews praise their deity using the exclamations Ewa Sabao, chants that are typically related to Dionysus. 